All right, we need to talk about quasars. Quasars. Fascinating, strange, bizarre, mysterious objects. Quasars were first discovered back in the 1960s. There was a neat project where they were looking at radio sources in the sky, and then during the, the, during the nighttime, they would, you know, they say, okay, here's a bright source of radio waves, and then during the nighttime, they point a telescope over there and say, oh, yeah, I can see that why that would be radios. That's a big cloud of gas, or that's some weird star, all this sort of thing. And they're pointing things out, and then they found that there was this blue star, blue star, that was, appeared to be this huge source of radio waves, and they couldn't figure out why. You know, radio waves. Uh, so they called it a quasar, a quasi-stellar radio object. So if I'm an astronomer, so okay, so, so they look at this, this quasi-stellar radio object. It looks like a star for all the world, but it's putting out tons and tons of radio waves. So what's the deal? Fairly bright, you can almost see, you can see with an amateur quality telescope. And so people are looking at this, and they're like, well, what's, what's the story? Uh, Martin Schmidt down at Caltech was studying uh, the, the, the first one of these back in the 1960s. And so he's like, what is this crazy star that seems to be putting out lots of radio waves? If I'm an astronomer, I want to get inside a star, I want to understand a star, what do I do? I take a spectrum. He took a spectrum. Look at that spectrum of light from the star. Look at those absorption lines. Understand what it's made of. And at first he looked at the lines. He couldn't tell what they were. He could not understand them at all. It didn't make any sense. Uh, first he couldn't identify them. But it turned out that he saw absorption lines lines, which are usually found in the ultraviolet. He was finding them way down in the visible. From... The UV was in the visible. Visible. Ultraviolet has very short wavelengths, but these wavelengths have been stretched out into visible wavelengths. Why would it do that? Why would the ultraviolet absorption lines be appearing in the visible? Well, in order to do that, in order to shift the wavelength of light, to take the wavelength of light, to move that, a motion will change it. If a star is moving towards us, then its light waves get compressed, and so all its wavelengths shift toward the shorter end of the spectrum, toward the blue end of the spectrum. On the other hand, if a star is moving away from us, that will stretch out its wavelengths and push them from the ultraviolet, in this case, all the way down into the visible part of the spectrum. This is called the Doppler effect. Okay, so we've got this. So we've got these absorption lines. So the Doppler effect, Doppler effect, in this case, is causing what we call a red shift. A red shift is where it takes short wavelengths and stretches them out into long wavelengths. Short wavelengths become long wavelengths as a result of motion away from us. Caused by motion away from us. So what's the story on this? Why would this, oh, so, so Martin Schmidt's, oh, this, this object is moving away from us at colossally fantastic speed. Why would it be doing it? Doesn't it like us? What's the deal here? And he figures this must be the result of Hubble's law. Away from us. Moving away from us at high speed. So this QSO, this quasar, is moving away, away at high Speed! Why would it be moving away from us at high speed? Ooh, Hubble's law. The universe is expanding. It's getting carried away by the expansion of the universe. Edwin Hubble finds that there's a relationship between the distance to a galaxy and its velocity away from us because this is moving away from us at really, really fantastically high speed. Schmidt calculates, well, this must be one of the most distant objects in the universe to be moving away from us at a significant fraction of the speed of light. So, it must be moving away at high speed, which means it must be very distant. If it is indeed the expansion of the universe, which is carrying it away from us and not something else, and yet it's bright. It's, it's, it's almost as bright you can see with an amateur quality telescope. How in the world, if this is one of the most distant objects in the universe, how in the world can we see it as a bright object? You can see it with an amateur quality telescope. If it's one of the most distant objects in the universe, well, that means it must be one of the most luminous objects in the universe. Colossally... Col oh, I can't even spell it. Colossally luminous. Very luminous. This must be giving off astonishing quantities of light. Fantastic quantities of light. This must be giving off millions and billions and hundreds of billions, and in some cases even trillions of times more light than our sun is. 
It's giving off more light than a whole galaxy of stars. And it's a single point, one tiny little point there. How in the world can it do this? So this happens in the 60s. At first, astronomers don't even believe it. It's like, could this be? We must be doing something wrong. Maybe it's moving away from us from some other reason. And then over the next couple of years, they figure they kind of rule out all the other possibilities. No. And there are many of these things. Uh, most of them actually aren't giving off lots of radio waves. So we, we, they're radio loud and radio quiet quasars. And so the, most of them are radio quiet. But they're star-like and they're colossally luminous. And it wasn't really solidly until the Hubble Space Telescope that finally found that, that was able to find that these quasars appear always at the center of a galaxy. So quasars, these fantastically luminous points. So quasars, quasars appear at galactic centers. I mean, when you got a quasar that's giving off, you know, 10 times, 100 times more light than a whole galaxy combined, after a while you don't see the rest of the galaxy, but Hubble was able to pull in and say, yeah, these things always appear in the centers of galaxies. So they really are in other galaxies. They're really far away. So what could do this? What could give off that much energy to power a quasar? So quasars are things we see, and so the hypothesis, the theory we have, so the theory... We have proposed to explain the existence of quasars, and in general, quasars are the brightest of something we call active galactic nuclei. There are, there are other arrangements. There are some galaxies that have a bright spot at the center, but it doesn't utterly dominate them. So overall, we call them active galactic nuclei. Quasars are the brightest of the active galactic nuclei. And the, theory, the only theory we've got which can explain that enormous quantity of energy, that huge luminosity, being all this light energy being released by these, by these, by, by these quasars, um, is that these are powered by a supermassive black hole. Supermassive black holes and that these have millions or tens of millions or hundreds of millions or maybe even a couple billion times the mass of the Sun. Supermassive black holes uh, millions to billions of solar masses. Now how is it is a black hole can give off, I mean how can a black hole be the brightest object in the universe again? Again it's not the black hole that's giving off the light but if you have a fantastically enormous black hole and then stuff is falling into it. It's not the black hole that gives off the light, it's stuff that's falling into it. Stuff orbits around the black hole and swirls around faster and faster and faster until it's going almost the speed of light and all the friction of all the stuff falling into the black hole, the stuff falling, getting close to the black hole gets colossally hot. And when we looked at the spectrum of light from quasars, it matches up with what the laws of physics say we should get from hot gas flowing into, swirling around, spiraling into a black hole. And so, and today we've even got even better evidence. We've measured the orbits of stars near the centers of these quasars, these, and we find that at the center of galaxies, you almost always find these supermassive black holes. In our galaxy, there's a relatively small one, only a few million times the mass of the sun, and in other galaxies, there are other sorts of things. And they're wonderful, and it's an interesting field, and it makes sense. The spectrum of light we get from these theoretical supermassive black holes matches up with a spectrum of light we actually measure from these real quasars. But the question is, where did the supermassive black holes come from? We do not know that. I mean, the most massive star has, what, 100, 200, 300 times the mass of the sun? That's nowhere close to millions. So how do you make a black hole that big? Well, um, do you take a little one and feed it? Maybe that can work. Um, quasars started in our universe relatively early, just a couple billion years after the Big Bang. We see quasars shining out through the universe. We can see them from really far away. Um, how do you form them so fast? Do you form stars first? Do you merge other black holes together? Do you just get a bunch of gas together and form it without forming a star first? We don't know. And that's a really interesting question. So right now we are trying to figure out supermassive black holes in order to explain uh, the observed phenomenon of quasars, the brightest objects in our universe.